Everybody, good morning. July 10th. And that means July 10th. That means I'm one day away from a, a couple birthdays. <clears throat> if I remember, it's uh, Sarah's birthday is coming up. A friend, Sarah, a young friend. And uh, my dad's AA birthday as well is on the 11th. Uh, my dad probably would have been, well, let me think, around 42 years sober uh, if he was still with us right now. So, yeah, very cool. So, July, that, that July month always gets me, of course, my birthday's the second. And then, you know, we got all these different birthdays kind of wrapped in there. And it's always been a special month uh, for me, of course. So hope you're doing good. This is the Morning Devo with Boa. You could always check out the archives at my YouTube channel, Boalette. 
just go to YouTube, go to the search bar, type in Bo Willette, very French name, a lot of vowels, you'll get it. And you can see all the books of the Bible I've gone over. So we're in the book of Jeremiah right now. And we finished Isaiah, which was absolutely insane. And Jeremiah's, man, on uh, the right path, isn't it? Boy, chapter 2 was long, and it uh, was very good. Gosh, it kind of had that really famous passage in it, uh, you know, uh, that we have uh, abandoned God, and we have uh, that he is the fountain of living water. And, of course, this is a, a big thing when Jesus comes on the scene that he points to himself as being this person, right? Right? This Yahweh. Um, and this is why every time Jesus opened his mouth, he was claiming to be God. Um, yeah, there, you know, when people ask those questions, hey, did Jesus claim to be God? They just don't know the Bible. They don't understand how Jesus taught and how he spoke. And he spoke as first person Yahweh. So very cool. And it says they have dug out for themselves cisterns that can hold no water. So it was very good, famous passage. Jeremiah 2, verse 13. Check it out. So chapter three, okay, we got done two, now we're in three. Here we go. Okay, ready? Hope you guys are doing good. And uh, thanks for be praying for uh, friends, my friend back home. Uh, yeah, gosh, man, just uh, a real yucky injury. Uh, you just never know, right, when something's going to happen. Um, and uh, really messed up his neck and that C7 vertebrate. So, um, man, if you could be praying for him, I really appreciate it. And thank you, church, for that. Thank you for just the prayer support. It's the beauty of the church, for sure. Okay, let's get into it. And Paula, your brother's birthday is today, 57. That's awesome. So I'm like a little brother to you, Paula. That's kind of cool. Okay, chapter three. If a man divorces a woman... And she goes and marries someone else. Okay, you with me? And remember, Israel's already been likened to like a runaway bride, right? A bride who's gone astray. So if a man divorces a woman and she marries someone else, he will not take her back again. For that would surely corrupt the land. But you have prostituted yourself with many lovers. So why are you trying to come back to me? So it's kind of the, the lesser to the greater kind of talk, right? Hey, this is bad, but you kind of, you, you're worse, you know, kind of chat uh, there. You know, if a man divorces a woman and she goes and marries someone else, the first man's not going to take her back again. That would be totally corrupt. I, I, I really find it interesting when it says corrupt the land really moves us back to the book of Leviticus in the, the Torah, the law, uh, the sexual sins that are mentioned in, uh, what is it, chapter 18, maybe? And it talks about how it defiles the land. That's kind of something that's uh, there in that Leviticus passage. Maybe there's more uh, than uh, what you think. But remember, God was to inhabit the praises of his people and for God to be his presence to be there there was going to have to be this kind of change right in the way people lived because God is holy and God would judge sin so man you want God to hang out with you well there's some ramifications for that and it says, but you prostituted yourself with many lovers. So why are you trying to come back to me? Says the Lord. Look at the shrines on every hilltop. Is there any place you have not been defiled by your adultery with other gods? And so in Jeremiah, we really hone in on this idea of Israel being married to God, to Yahweh, that they've entered into this relationship and it's it's. It's, it's likened to a husband and a wife, predominantly. I mean, there's other things too, but it's predominantly a husband and a wife. And uh, it's not that it's always that. I want you to understand it's not always that. Uh, Israel's also likened to other things. But in m most of these sections, you're going to see it's a husband and a wife. 
And so, again, in that idea is like, hey, who are you to like, you know, talk about me? You know, who are us as human beings to rip on God when if you just look at us, maybe maybe we're the problem, right? And it says, um, you sit alone like a nomad in the desert. You have polluted the land with your prostitution and your wickedness. So you see that the prostitution is, again, it is a type. It's a picture of a spiritual issue where you go astray. But it's likened to that of a prostitute, right? It's likened to that of a woman who marries another and comes back to the first. But it's worse because it's like a prostitute in that it goes, you go to many people, but then you go back, right, uh, to your husband. Hey, husband, I'm home. You know, what'd you do today? Well, I, I, I made some money, you know. Well, how'd you do that? Well, I was working on Hollywood and Vine, you know. And sure, I was with, you know, 10 dudes, but I'm back, you know. Oh, you know, that kind of idea. And it says, that's why even the spring rains have failed, for you are a brazen prostitute. Kind of heavy, I guess, hard-hearted and completely shameless. Mm, just no, no shame at all. You know, I, it's hard for me to like bag on many people because I know what this is like. Shameless, pl completely shameless. Have I done things that are completely shameless? Gosh, yeah. You know, haven't you ever saw things in your own life where you go, man, I can't believe I did that, you know? And then there's times where you, you do it and you don't even think twice about it. Completely shameless. Yet you say to me, Father, you have been my guide since my youth. Surely you won't be angry forever. Surely you can't forget about it, or you can forget about it. So you talk, but you keep on doing all the evil you can. Mm. Yahweh always speaks to the people to show them their sin. Yahweh always speaks to the people to show them their sin so that they can cry out for what? Salvation. This is how Jesus teaches. This is how he talks. He always, Jesus always speaks to the people to show them their sin and their need of salvation. That's how he teaches. That's how he talks. You know, he's always teaching in a way and talking in a way where people can see their sin and go, man, I need a savior. And so... Oh, here's, I, I, got a, I got a wonderful little treat for you guys. Check this out. Look at this. Come here. Come here. Look at this. That's Beans. Oh, Beans, say hi to everybody. <laughs> there you go, Beans. Oh, wasn't that cool? I, I've never had the door open before where beans could come in, but hey, today, July 10th, is the day. Isn't that cute? Wasn't that awesome? Yeah, he's a precious. So Jesus teaches just like this. So it says, During the reign of King Josiah, the Lord said to me, Have you seen what fickle Israel has done? What a wife who commits adultery. Israel has worshipped other gods on every hill and under every green tree. I thought after she is done with all this, she will return to me, but she did not return. And her faithless sister, Judah, saw this. She saw that I divorced faithless Israel because of her adultery. So it's speaking of Israel at the, and these are the tribes that what's called the Northern tribes, 10 of them. And then there's the other sister, the Southern tribes, two in particular. And it says, she saw that I divorced faithless Israel, the north, because of her adultery. But that treacherous sister Judah, the south, had no fear. And she, too, now has left me and given herself to prostitution. Israel treated it all so lightly. She thought nothing of committing adultery by worshiping idols made of wood and stone. 
So now the land has been polluted. But despite all this, her faithless sister Judah has never secretly returned to me or sincerely returned to me. She has only pretended to be sorry. I, the Lord, have spoken. Wow. You know, I, I can totally relate to this. You know, the idea of polluting a land. Gosh, did I pollute my land? You know, am I a part of the problem of polluting the land? You know, again, it's easy to look at other people and go, oh, they're so bad. They're, yeah, but again, just look at you. That's all you got is you. So you don't live in those other people. You live in you. So it's like, you know, what have you done to pollute the land? You know? I love it, right? There's always those people that are like, man, I got a Tesla and, and man, I'm really doing great, you know, with, you know, my carbon emissions and, you know, all that stuff like that. Oh yeah. Really look at your life. <laughs> look at how much carbon emissions it was to build the car. Right. And the other atrocities that it took to, to put that thing together. Um, you know, you can't get out of the polluting business. That's the problem, right? It says in the New Testament that Jesus, through his sacrifice and forgiveness of sins, that we actually have been moved away from this polluted world. And now we've become part of another kingdom that is not of this world. And so the way we've got out of pollution is through a spiritual birth, is through being born again, born anew, born into the family of God, right? Part of his family now. So now I am really a part of a family that will do things right, that will be redeemed. We'll have it all together one day. But on this planet, the land has been certainly, what, polluted, you know, can God really come to this earth and dwell with us? I mean, what I mean, what does that say about God? If God can literally just hang out with us all the time, we're polluted, right? So I can really relate to this. And pretending to be sorry? Hmm. I wonder if that's some of my attitude. You know, do I pretend to be sorry? Oh, I'm so sorry. Haven't I done that before? Absolutely, yeah. Um, you know, you can say like, oh, no, I've never done that. But again, it it sounds super prideful when you go that direction. You mean you've never pretended to be sorry? Every time you were sorry, you really meant it? Every time? Hmm. And when it comes down with the force to which God is speaking, I, the Lord, have spoken. Very Jesus-like, where you don't kind of say to Jesus, hey, Jesus, can I correct you? You know, I'll correct you a little bit. You know, no, because he has spoken. It's the end, done, right? He is the authority. That's what makes me laugh about sometimes us humans, where we look to Jesus, we look at Jesus and we go, oh, Jesus got it wrong. And we go, like, what? Jesus got it wrong? Like, you think you're smarter than Jesus. You know, that that's just a little bit of arrogance, right? But we're good like that. Us humans certainly know how to bring the arrogance, don't we? Now, there's hope. There's hope in such a dire chapter two and such a beginning of chapter three of like, man, you're worse than that woman who's marrying a bunch of dudes and coming back to the first one. And, you know, you're worse than that. You're like a prostitute. I mean, all that talk. It says, then the Lord said to me, even faithless Israel, the north, is less guilty than treacherous Judah, the south. Therefore, go and give this message to Israel, those people up on the north, the north side. This is what the Lord says, O oh, Israel, my faithless people, come home to me again, and I am merciful. Wow. Unbelievable. God's mercy. His ways are not our ways, right? That's what he said in Isaiah. I'll have mercy on you because my ways are higher than yours. What is higher? My mercy is higher than yours. That's why. what. It says, I will not be angry with you forever. Only acknowledge your guilt. Admit that you rebelled against the Lord your God. Just admit your guilt. Confess your sins. And he is what? Faithful and just to forgive you. Yeah, just confess it. 
man, Lord, we've rebelled, man. We messed up. We're a mess. And it says the Lord will be merciful. I will not be angry with you forever. Only acknowledge your guilt. Admit that you rebelled against the Lord your God and committed adultery against him by worshiping idols under every green tree. Confess that you refuse to listen to my voice. I, the Lord, have spoken. Just say what's true. You know, can you do that? Can I do that? Or do we have an excuse? Do we have something that we can kind of say, you know, oh, I did it because of this, or ah, da, 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 da. why did that because, or is it just I rebelled? I rebelled from God. Hmm. Return home, you wayward children, says the Lord, for I am your master. I will bring you back to the land of Israel, one of from this town and one from that family. Hey, I'm going to bring you back. I'll bring you back into that land. Isn't it interesting? We have a country called Israel today. Hmm. Maybe God has been really faithful to his word to bring them back into the land. And I will give you shepherds after my own heart who will guide you with knowledge and understanding. Wow. They will get people that will help them. Maybe guys like Ezra, uh, Ezra, Nehemiah, people like that. And when your land is once more filled with people, says the Lord, you will no longer wish for the good old days when you possess the Ark of the Lord's Covenant. And I love that. One day you won't even look back and say, oh, those were the good old days, right? It says you will not miss those days or even remember them. And there will be no need to rebuild the Ark. And that day Jerusalem will be known as the throne of the Lord. All nations will come there to honor the Lord. They will no longer stubbornly follow their own evil desires. In those days, the people of Judah and Israel will return together from exile in the north. They will return to the land I give their ancestors and inheritance them forever. So Israel one day will come from the northern lands and come down and live in Israel once again. Maybe this was the time when they, after their Babylonian captivity, could even point to the future time during the time of the 1940s, the 1950s, and of course the 1960s. In our time, right, where Israel came from the northern European countries down into their land. So that's kind of interesting. And it'll be a time where they won't really, uh, there's going to be a time where they're not going to really uh, care so much about the ark. And there's some interesting things, right? We will have no need to rebuild the ark, right, of the Lord's covenant, right? The tabernacle it says, man, Jerusalem's going to be the place of worship, right? And it says the nations will no longer stubborn, stubbornly follow their own evil desires. So that makes me think that maybe the world is stubbornly following their own evil desires. Maybe that's what we do as nations too. All of the nations of the world just stubbornly go their own direction. Hmm. Maybe nations are just like people, right? All of us just kind of go astray, each their own way, right? Mm. Again, it's tough to read the Bible sometimes because it kind of really it really launches a scud at our pride. It really hits our pride square on. And it humbles us. Either we're going to come humbly or we're just going to throw the books aside, right? Mm. I thought to myself, I would love to treat you as my own children. I wanted nothing more than to give you this beautiful land. Mm, the idea of the, them being children of God. The finest possession in the world, meaning this land. The most precious, beautiful place. The finest possession. I look forward to your calling me father, and I wanted you never to turn from me. Again, another idea of calling God father. Something that has been reiterated from the Psalms. But you have been unfaithful to me, your people, uh, the people of Israel. You have been like a faithless wife who leaves her husband. I, the Lord, have spoken. So you see that when Jesus teaches us to pray, our Father who are in heaven, he, he definitely knows these passages. He knows that this is the tender mercy of God, that God is merciful and as a father wants his children to come to them. And what does he want them to do? Remember that he's holy. 
right? Remember that his will is that we are to pray for his will to be done. That we are to pray and be thankful for our daily bread. That we are to confess our sins. Do you see how this is all threaded already in Jeremiah? The idea that God is the provider for Israel. And God is the one who wants them to confess their sins to him. So when Jesus says, hey, call, say, our Father, he's trying to point all the disciples back to these passages to help them understand that God, Yahweh, is there with them and that he's saying, hey, you're my children. Share with me. Talk to me. That kind of idea. It's super sweet. And it says, but you have been unfaithful to me, you people of Israel. You have been like a faithless wife who leaves her husband. I, the Lord, have spoken. Verse 27, voices are heard high on the wind-swept mountains and weeping and pleading of Israel's people. I've been up on high mountains skiing, and man, it can get really windy up there. And uh, it sounds kind of like a weeping. And it says, for they have chosen crooked paths and have forgotten the Lord their God. You know, what's the path that I'm on? Have you, have you ever been on a crooked path? Yeah, one that's bent, right? Mm. Jesus says, you know, wide is the path that leads to destruction. And many go in that way. You know, many are on that crooked road. And it says, my wayward children, says the Lord, come back to me and I will heal your wayward heart. Yes, we're coming. The people reply for you are the Lord, our God, our worship of idols on the hills and our religious orgies on the mountains are a delusion. Only in the Lord, our God, will Israel ever find salvation. It says, man, all our sexual stuff, all of our sexual deviancy, our worship of the other gods, man, it's all off. It's all off base. You know, it's interesting to look at our sexuality and, you know, that's always something to really look at and hone in on in our life. Humans are sexual beings and, you know, in human, in human history, it's been very difficult for us humans to be especially heterosexual monogamous. We don't do it very well. I don't know if you've noticed that. We all kind of want to go that direction. But we don't do it very well. We tend to be all over the place, right? To be with one person your whole life, no other person in your mind, in your thoughts, in nothing is, I don't know, I never met that person, you know. And God saw that what they did is they went and started worshiping other gods and those other gods, the way they were worshipped is sometimes through just sexual deviancy, just doing whatever you wanted sexually. And so really it became like a god of sex, so to speak, you know, like the Romans and the people of Greece and many other cultures have had. And Israel just went that direction Instead of looking at their descendants and looking at their history and all the books that were written about what God had intended for sexuality, one man, one woman for life, they looked around and went, man, that looks kind of fun. I think I'm going to go do it. Why not live for pleasure? Like, what's the big issue? You know, why not do something that's pleasurable? You live once and then you die right kind of idea see very much like our culture today you know that has adopted a very hedonistic not just attitude but everything economic attitude everything it revolves around more 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 pleasure 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 comfort 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 all of that so it's like we've corrupted everything and maybe in our culture we've adopted these pagan gods and we just don't call them the same names, but it's like still there, so to speak, you know. So don't think this is just some old fuddy-duddy, you know, pagan weird thing in the jungle kind of thing. No, I think this is very, very true to today. And, you know, if I must say, we live in an interesting culture. We live in a culture where, you know, free adult material 
is just that. It's free. And what a test that we're in, right? Gosh, could you imagine growing up and having free adult stuff, what we call adult entertainment, but free? I mean, that's unbelievable. For my people my age, that wasn't the, it wasn't that way. You know, you went to the corner store in your neighborhood and they had magazines behind the counter, but you couldn't see them. And nowadays, kids that grow up just grow up with it. They don't think any different. It is their world. Isn't that interesting? Yeah, that's, and, and it's changed their, it, their, or let me say this, their thinking is different from our thinking because of it. And it's been free now for a long, long time. So we live in a culture that I want you to see that maybe is very similar to this culture in a lot of ways. You know, and it makes me think of me too. You know, how I succumb to that. How I can move in those directions. How my brain can go in different directions. And... And that's something to work on all the time in life. You know, there's no temptation that has overtaken you that is not common to human beings. It's common. This kind of action is common. It's not abnormal to humans. It is what humans do. It's gnarly. It's a bummer. Hurts a lot of people. But we don't do well with our mm, sexuality, so to speak. And God sees it, right? And he sees it for what it is, an idolatry. Read Colossians 3, and you'll see kind of it talked about as idolatry. And it's on all these hills, and it says, From childhood we have watched as everything our ancestors worked for, their flocks and herds, their sons, daughters, was squandered on a delusion. Man, you guys were delusional. You worshipped something that wasn't even true. Let us now lie down in shame and cover ourselves with dishonor, for we and our ancestors have sinned against the Lord our God. From our childhood to this day, we have never obeyed him. Okay, so you see the confession that is written in Jeremiah 3. This is a confessional kind of letter at the end. All of us have sinned. We've never obeyed you. We've never obeyed you. Isn't that amazing? Man, I've never obeyed the Lord. I mean, just confessing that to God. I've never obeyed you. I've always gone astray. I've always moved in my own direction. God, I need saving. I need salvation. The only way I can honor you is if you are in me, living your life out through me, that somehow you are loving through me, that you take over and you take the wheel, so to speak, and move through me. Everything in my flesh is not good. Nothing good in my flesh dwells. It says, isn't that interesting? Oh, but something dwells good. I know I'm obeying God somewhere. I know I got something down. Nope. Oh, such a hard word. It really shows us, too, what confession's like, you know, just how forthright and how this confession is a pretty gnarly. It really spells out in detail what they did wrong, right, on the high hills. You know, if you come to God or I come to God and we say, Hey, God, this is what I'm watching. This is what I've done. This is what I continue to do. Lord, you see it. Lord, help me. See, you have to say what it is. God's a big person (laughs) in the sense that God can handle. I say that in a uh, kind of a sense, uh, a humor sense, you know, that God's able to handle what is our confession? You know, just say it like it is. You know, tell it like it is. You know, and that's the right way to confess. So do I do that? Hmm, something to think about today. Uh, to bring that honest heart before God, knowing that He is merciful. I love how there's that balance there in the, the passage. That God is there. He's merciful. He's saying to the northern tribes, come to me. And I will have mercy. So very cool. Very, very awesome. 
Jeremiah is one of those books that is a little bit like, um, you know, what is it? Mature rating, you know, for sure. So uh, it's a it's a heavy book. Um, that and Ezekiel will be heavy books uh, for sure in this area. But hey, we're we're big people. I think we we can we can do this, right? So you guys take care. Have a great day. Jeremiah three in the books. Bye bye.